What a fantastic buzz there is in, in this room uh, and in this building today. And, and I had a similar buzz last week. I was in Silicon Valley meeting a number of health tech entrepreneurs uh, and people that are really progressing that. And I think what I find so exciting about the world that we live in today and gatherings such as these and, and Silicon Valley is the enthusiasm, the optimism, the positivity the collaboration and the sharing that everyone's willing to, uh, to share with each other. And I think that's an energy that we just haven't seen when we've been behind that, that dreadful like Zoom screen. Having said that, I do love technology. Um, I, yeah, of course, I lead a big team, but I don't speak to all of those people all of the time to, to get that into perspective. Um, I started life as a biochemist, but for the last 25 years or so, I have been working in consulting. Um, really in health and, and technology and, and for the last few years been leading the team at EY. So I'm going to talk about the intelligent health ecosystem as uh, the, the host introduced. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about data and, and technology. I'm going to talk a bit about a vision for an interconnected ecosystem where data is exchanged, not necessarily transported to really drive personalized insights so we can actually be treated better, more cost-effectively, more quickly, um, and that's something I feel very passionate about. And then I'm going to also then talk about user experience. Uh, and I think it's interesting, if you look around the, um, the showcases that we've got on the floor above um, today, almost all of them are looking at the consumer or the patient or the physician user experience. And I think that's something that we can learn in health from, from other industries, and, and what does that mean and how do we take it forward? So a bit wacky perhaps, but is this the future physician? Is the future physician really um, a, a maybe called a medical engineer, um, augmented, not replaced, but augmented by a lot of technology? One positive, if there is a positive thing coming out of COVID, is the willingness that globally we as societies have embraced virtual care. And that, of course, if we were able to unlock that successfully, could really help better access, more affordable healthcare to, to folk. But it shouldn't be compromised on the quality. So perhaps this is the future. Perhaps the physician is that medical engineer inside containers in the local medical park, augmented by technology. But that can only work, and I'll come on to later, if we as individuals, whether we're healthy, whether we've got um, a condition, actually are being monitored by some very sophisticated sensors that are personalized, again, to us as individuals, not necessarily as large population cohorts of, of, um, of the population. Um, I, I've got a little nanobot on here, I, although I was re reminded last week, a, a scientist who works in nanotechnology, that nanobots, I should really rephrase my slide to sort of nanotransporters or nanotech, n more broadly nanotechnology, we're not going to have little robots inside us, but I think the, the success of nanotechnology that we're now seeing evidenced in, in medicine today is hugely, hugely exciting. And, and for those of you who are, are more physicians or scientists in the audience, of course, the new MRI, uh, mRNA technologies with the, the COVID vaccine all rely on um, nanotech to actually transport the, uh, the active mRNA to the place that it needed to get to. Um, so that's potentially the future physician. Again, if we move on to the smart home, um, I don't know how many people have uh, lots of gadgets in their home, but I think there's a whole swathe now of moving to having more gadgets in our home. Um, you know, is this the future? Are we actually in the age of antibiotic resistant bacteria going to have genomic sequences that actually scan our food for bacterial genomes? Um, very plausible, very possible. Um, and at how are we going to live? Um, are we going to have biometric tattoos, you know, as well as the, the, my, my favorite gadget, my Apple Watch? And, and as these things develop further, we can see lots and lots of, not necessarily clinical data points, but lots of data points that can build a, a very much holistic picture. So some people argue or disagree, but I think you can see that the future world that we live in will be different, but how we can manage our health and manage ourselves at a very personalized level is very, very possible. 
I think this is an amazing statistic, and you can see at the bottom of the left-hand slide, in, in 2021, every person on this planet generated 50 terabytes of data. Now, of course, that's an average. But I was doing some sums at home this morning, and I was just thinking about what, or how, how I might speak to this slide. So 50 terabytes of data, golly, and then um, we have here, you know, a terabyte equals 500 hours of HD video. So 50 terabytes sort of got you to three and a half years of HD video, and that was just phenomenal. Not all of it, though, is, of course, health data. If you think about our daily lives today and what we've done, how we've interacted with our apps on our phones, with um, and anything to do with data to sort of transport us to this place today. Um, you know, we all touch that. But, but what is irrefutable is that the explosion in health data is much, much greater than anything else. You can see here 36% uh, is expected and the next uh, highest growth areas in, in manufacturing and financial services are, are, are mere 6%. Um, lots and lots of sensors in the world. Um, another interesting statistic is almost all of the health data that we will use in the future, 80% of it will reside or be generated outside of the clinical record. So I think that's quite an important factor. And, and we had a great speech just now in terms of different data points from gaming could actually be a, a very good indicator. And I, and I guess, and uh, we spoke a little earlier, that the, the previous speaker and I, about how you can actually manage a condition going forward. So there's loads and loads of data. So what does it mean for health? Um, we've got sensors sort of inside us. I, I'm really excited again. I'll mention the nanotechnology. Some of the ingestibles that are now um, uh, in pilot phase can actually measure um, how we metabolize some of the medicines that we're given, how our body changes in terms of the care pathway that we're on, and, and we can make micro adjustments. Don't get me wrong, I think the genomic sequencing and the genomic predictions are fantastic, but it's that next layer upon what our genes tell us is probable, the actual, is, is, is actually measuring how our bodies are performing from things like these smart tattoos or, or these ingestibles. And of course, we've got patches. So there's lots of things, um, and I'm saying this internet of medical things, the sensors generating from inside us and on us. Of course, around the smart home, you know, lots of things can be monitoring us. There's some really exciting research being done in homes around asthma care and linking the environment to, to the actual individual, um, not only in the home, but, of course, in uh, facilities such as here or, or specialist medical facilities. So everywhere, really, we're getting to that explosion, that 36% growth in health data with an internet of medical things everywhere. So I think the, the question that, that we really need to ask ourselves is, well, how do we use that productively, responsibly, um, listening to some of the other speakers today, thinking about ethically uh, how we actually use some of this data. But, but I also think that it's data isn't the issue or, or actually where the value is. It's it's what you do with that data. How much of data really needs to be transferred or moved? Actually, not as much as you think. Some of the uh, innovations we're doing at EY about um, helping both payers and um, biopharmers actually get paid for the outcome their um, medicine actually delivers. Um, the data that we are interrogating to measure whether an outcome, as predefined, is met or not met, the data doesn't actually move, it's the interrogation. You fire questions into that data to get insights that are actionable, that is the valuable bit. I speak to many data scientists and they, and they tell me that actually data is a cost, owning data is a cost, but actually having the ability to interrogate data, being clear on what data sets you want to interrogate, actually to drive the, the insight is, is where the actual value is. So we've got a lot of data. Um, we don't need necessarily to transport it. We need access to it and to interrogate it. Um, I'm really, really encouraged, and I'm sure some folk in, in the audience are, are at the forefront of some of the technology advancements in AI, but we're moving vastly beyond the computational aspects of AI. We're moving much more now in, into the cognitive areas of AI. Again, the, the, the technology can augment 
the, the user, be it us, the consumer, be it the physician. Uh, you can see on, on the left-hand side of, of this slide, we've got you know, many of the AI technologies. I'm particularly focused at the moment on some knowledge graphs, um, but the algorithms are, are getting more and more sophisticated. And, and on the right-hand side of, of this slide, you can see some of the use cases, um, the behavioral use cases, the, the smart use cases, um, some of the remote patient monitoring, if you go back to the um, medical engineers inside the, um, inside the container. But very effective treatment can only be done if there's some remote patient monitoring. And the AI helps the physician um, or the medical engineer to use that uh, to treat effectively. But we can only start to make this shift, as I say, because um, AI is becoming more cognitive rather than just computational. I'm very excited about that, uh, especially the, the reasoning, again, the, the options that, that perhaps the AI and the technology can actually give us. Um, moving quite quickly, um, there is a longer version that the team are releasing uh, this week, so if you are interested, you can go on my LinkedIn or on, on our ey.com to actually find the, the longer version of these slides. Um, one thing I'm fascinated with, and I referred to it at the beginning, is if we are to make the progress that I dearly hope we do in, in healthcare, if we look at what are the winning characteristics in other industries and what has made leaders the leaders in, in other industries. And, and we know patient expectations are, are getting higher than ever. But, but, but so it, it's all about user experience. And if you look at Amazon or, or Airbnb or Netflix and Uber, it doesn't really matter what they're doing, if you look at why the user experience is just so good and why they have got the leadership positions in their industries that they have, the characteristics seem to be, and, and obviously you can extend this out for not just these four, you can you know, go to 20 to 30 um, leaders, it all boils down to some very clear characteristics. It has to be convenient, it has to be seamless, um, there has to be an element of personalization arguably predictive. Um, certainly me now, I, I'm actually quite astonished what Netflix is actually sharing with me that I should watch. And, and my partner at home actually, for the same film, gets a different encouragement visual from Netflix, depending on their preferences. So I think that's quite interesting. The, the personalization is not just, oh, what's trending today? It's, it's some film. It's actually the picture in that film will be appealing to me, Pamela, as opposed to somebody else, even though I live in the same house as them. There's a lot of choice. I think that's a, the key aspect, and, it, and it's very transparent. Uh, and I think this is really, really, really probably going to be the most defining thing. The technologies can take us so far, but it's the user experience that, that is really going to help us. And um, there's a, a, a friend that I was speaking to earlier on at, at lunchtime. If you think about um, how has, I mean, there's lots of diabetes um, apps and, and support, but if you think about what is most popular now with diabetes uh, sufferers, it's the always on continuous reader. It's not the, the insulin pump, which is a bit difficult to wear or, or pricking your finger. It's the always on continuous measurement. Arguably, you don't need an HPA1C test now every three months or so because that continuous always on reading might not be as scientifically accurate as the older style blood test or, or insulin pump but it's much more convenient, so therefore it's getting traction, and actually because it's always on, actually it gives you a better overall result. So I think these user experiences is gonna be really, really, really important as we go forward, and, and that's why I was particularly encouraged when I mentioned that um, so many of the new innovations that we see, not only at the startup stage, but, but upstairs on uh, level minus one, are all about helping the user experience, be it on the consumer or the physician, better. I am passionate, though, about how this all comes together and how technology can actually enable that superfluid data exchange around the system. And, and there's a, a more detailed version of this, to say, in the, in the more lengthy slides. But how do we bring it all together? We have to have a better interconnected ecosystem. I understand some speakers earlier on today talked about being smarter, sharing more. 
but it, it, it's care about what we share. We don't have to share anything, everything, sorry. We can just share certain aspects and not all of the data that we generate is so personal to us. A lot of it can be used uh, in terms of patient cohort monitoring. Um, so actually having an interconnected ecosystem where data actually sits at the periphery, but insights are fired around depending on the user depending on the user's needs around that interconnected system. And, and most importantly, in the middle, there's a data exchange architecture. There's not a data lake, it's a data exchange architecture. So I've got the red light flashing at me. Um, I'll close with this is what this is the, the single topic that I'm speaking to most of the clients that I interact with personally at, at EY about. If your company's future value, or I do believe your company's future value, and if you're not really focused on how you are unlocking the power of data to drive that personalized health experience by connecting and combining data sets to drive insights and action that's meaningful, then I would challenge whether your strategy and your company has really got a place of uh, thrive rather than just survive in the future. So just finally to close, I think data is the fuel. The science and technology can very much be the engine, but it's all about insights that we can measure, both clinical and non-clinical, but user experience will really um, define the value to get us to those demonstrated health um, outcomes and reimbursement that, that we need to, to uh, further healthcare for all. So I'll finish that. Thank you very much.